So in the late 80s, when Wayne Barker, Kendall Gears, and some other artists and myself had a studio in Troy Street, downtown Joburg, near the Mai Mai Market, I would leave my children uh, at school, I would take them to school, and then come into town and walk the streets before I got to the studio so that I could get a feeling for painting, so that I could get some passion. And um, I had just a small little Olympus, I'm no photographer, and there I saw on the wall of, in N Street there, near the Mai Mai Market, I saw this painted Zulu with the word Zulu. So I took my camera and shot it for that image. I thought it was amazing. Weeks later, when I had to have the photos developed in the little shop, as was the case, this man had entered my photograph. I had not seen him. I had not seen him. And that man became my idea for the other, because before that I was working with Everard Reed. I had exhibitions every year painting very intimate portraits and people around tables and people that I knew. And I then left Everard Reed in order to become more like a voyeur instead of painting intimate and so it was a began departure from a, your a departure normal from style. my normal yeah. from so years you actually of painting. started a completely new journey completely completely yeah. new and this man when i end my journey to tell about my work this african man with his hat and his briefcase a worker became my vision for crossing over to Europe, to Middle East, to all the other things that have absorbed me now and painted. And this North, South, East, West panel tells my entire story of my life from years of collecting iconic images. And at the very end of this journey, the European man from Berlin, Berlin, which was the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Berlin and I was there, in the Martin Gropius building they had, that Berlin man became my European man for the Twitter painting and the Arab Revolution and everything after that. I then went back to the studio at Dick Enterven's place where I stayed for three months and I painted, I bought all the cards that I could and I painted the African man through my journey as he walked, as he crossed over the street in Berlin, as he crossed past the European man, and back into my world. Okay, so in 2000, after working with this um, idea of always looking at the other, the, the person who doesn't have what us white privileged people do have, um, I worked with Dale Udelman in collaboration for seven years, and the very first show we did was 200 works where we had gone into the city and we had photographed people walking in order to do other paintings called the Din of Daily Life. In Dale's space was this photograph of a hundred year old South Africa. This particular man for, for Joburg man as the man who built our city crosses the borders. It's my man from always, that African man, and the man that leads into all my work, including native. And he's the man in He Walks and Talks, because this was taken from when Madiba was released, and he was in the stadium. There was Winnie and Madiba here, with Sisulu and Katrada and all the rest of them, and I took them out of the image from the photograph of the newspaper and decided that what is important is going forward, the man who, the worker, the man who is not talked about, the man who needs a voice. So he walks, they talk, the journey continues. The journey continues. At Mark Kutsir Gallery, when I first came to Cape Town, I had the exhibition departure, which was 21 panels of glass. And for some reason at that time, I must have picked up the Time magazine from 1983 where the, uh, George Siegel is sitting in front of the 
computer, if computer moves in, was the title of the Time magazine. And I thought, the world is going to change and it's going to be radical and it's going to be fast. And it freaked me out. And I thought, I'll paint this glass panel, but I will break it with a hammer to show the fragility. But the computer for me was, it was, it wasn't a good thing in my mind. It wasn't about communication and all the things that I've brought in afterwards. It was about the man sitting and being so focused into this machine. They spoke about the machine. It freaked me out. So I painted many, many paintings of this man absorbed by, into this machine. Smashed the piece and brought in the new, about, rebirth and crossing over into another country. Always painting the man for me was a question mark because people coming to my studio used to say to me, why do you always paint man? So I began painting the woman as the fragility of the woman and the, the weight of a woman in this country. And these works were particularly of South Africa at the time because as a single parent, as a woman, as an artist without money, I've also had to carry that burden. And the woman in my paintings represents the woman who carries the burden. And why I titled it Both Her Hands Full is because Mankoba, who, whose artwork and paintings is exquisite, he was exiled. He went into exile, and when he was in Paris, his work, in my opinion, deteriorated, and it was his longing for home and his sense of not being in his homeland. And Elsa Miles spoke about his mother, who she interviewed, who had held tradition in one hand and motherhood in the other hand. So for me, the screw represented the construction and deconstruction of homes and the longing to just own a home and build a home. Both her hands full. It's from Mankoba. So I moved studios above Lola's and there I began painting from my window of the studio. This is Brayton Street, out the window. And I began this painting on a horizontal surface because I knew I wanted to paint as I do with the politicians. I've painted about 100 politicians, businessmen and workers series, part of which was in Vodacom. And those people, in contrast, those, those are the people moving and creating something in our country. But always the politicians sitting around a board table are part of my work, which is part of the merry-go-round, the children being free and playing, while the politicians sit and talk and talk. And I tried to um, think out of the box from my studio and paint whatever I saw around me in our fairest Cape, which for me were the Cape Flats, where the people just become marks, anonymous little marks within a big area that's always fenced off and ugly. And the actual ship that came had to um, be in our waters before it could go to Nigeria. So I tried in this painting to bring in the refugees that I painted for Cuba and the person who does not belong so that the people who are bringing their belongings and coming to our country coming and going the refugees on the boats and crossing over the borders and the boundaries to find a home to have a place which is why I paint native because native is um, rooted in history. Every one of us is a native. So I get flack for using the title native because of our references to apartheid, but I don't care. Native for me is the, um, the everyman. Native is the everyman. So why the people in the Arab Spring and the people in that painting are silhouettes mm -hmm. is because they don't have to have a particular identity. They are all of us. It's the voice of a citizen. Yeah. In, okay. in terms of 
that painting, the disc cannot, the disc can only hold the message for a while. It's because uh, when the computer came out and we had the little discs and they only had a certain amount of gigabytes, it wasn't enough information. And as time developed, so the information was held on a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller disc. So in 1990 in London, I visited London, my mom sent me a letter, which is, I mean, I sound like an old, old, old person, but this is how quick it's all happened, is that she sent me a letter and she said, I'm watering the garden with a panic button in my hand, which for me was everything about living in the fucking suburbs. And then um, the letter across the air and the sea and now so 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 it's about the 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 voyeur the man or the surveillance and watching always watching and the us always having somebody on our backs and the intimacy of the woman and the water in the garden the painted mark and an aerial viewpoint which i think is important because i think a lot of my work is about me seeing from afar instead of being involved in an intimate relationship which I used to paint, I used to paint so intimately and now I think that my work is me like, like a drone hovering, hovering above somewhere and looking down upon what is happening but then I bring it so intimately to yeah. what it is. Yeah, you just express with very ethereal marks. The marks aren't even there, they're subconscious. They're completely subconscious because when the painting works, there's no thought process at all. And I think that this is how Concerned Citizen evolved. Because when I painted him, I painted the man knowing that he was the entrepreneur, the tourist, the visitor, the refugee, all the things that I had been painting came together in one painting for the first time, with the burden, the burden of what everybody's carrying. That's how that came about. I worked on it for years, for years and years. And it wasn't this painting, and it wasn't another painting, and it wasn't another painting. If they take an x-ray of it, there are about five finished, complete, good paintings, if I had to say so myself. But I reworked it the last time about two years ago, it stayed rolled in my studio from studio to studio and it's become a city as a city as a city because it's, um, it began in Joburg, this was in Joburg I think and then I made it evolve as I did the other work. So I tried to make the people even more ethereal and more there and not there and with what's going on at the moment. People are there one minute and gone the next. So, the city is the city is the city is from um, Picasso's friend Stain. What's her name? Yeah. Gertrude. Gertrude Stain. A rose is a rose is a rose. So, it's a city and a home is a home is a home. And I always say to my grandchildren when they ask a question, it just is. It just is. Yeah. Yeah. An opportunity that came my way was that Dick Enthoven gave me his palace in East Berlin in 2011. I flew there for three months, minus 14 degrees, I had a bicycle and I knew nobody. And to keep myself from going into a major depression, I had to communicate with myself. It was it was horrible and it was difficult and it was insular and isolating and the only contact I had with the outside world was my little computer where I tuned into Al Jazeera for the very first time and at that moment in history in 2011 in Tahrir Square in Egypt, they were beginning the revolution. They were beginning their voice being heard in such a foreign environment. 
I listened to what was going on. And at that time, we didn't know, we still don't know who were the terrorists, who were the mediators, who was who, which countries, etc. But I tried to follow it. And by following it, I realized that all my work is actually about the people talking and the, I don't know how to say this painting is so complex because I tore up pieces of paper because I painted and hated what I was doing and said I can't bring this work back. So I painted on one of those books with, for oil all prepared, 50 paintings and put them all around the house and then thought, no, fuck this, I can't even look at this work, so I tore them into pieces. So when I had these little pieces of paper, which is what Twitter is made of, I put them on the floor like Matisse, I just, like a daughter's event, and I put them on the floor and began walking round and round and round and round them and thinking, what the fuck is going on in the world? And trying to like find a thread to begin working for the three months that I was there. So, so in order to begin, I painted a little red square. I said, this is Tafnir Square. This is where the people come to. This is where one person decides to meet another. One person phones another person. And then I, as the media broadcast, they kept on saying about the, the phone, the cell phone is the voice of the revolution because without the cell phone nobody could connect. And the revolution began to be big before the police came in, the, 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 the people, and brought it back on the plane, put it back out there and I thought, well this is Twitter because the tweeting, the communication, there's no other way. And I think that this is like a seminal work for me because it's brought me to the point of um, we I don't know where to go anymore. I really don't know what else to paint because of the, the fucked upness of the world, because where we at. We, but it's too much history, there's too much burden. I just feel like I'm the concerned citizen and I don't want to be a wanted to collect money. So in Milton Market I bought banknotes only from the Southern African countries. Translated them onto cloth, this cloth, and worked with Dale Udelman to create livestock. The relevance of this work is that the aerial view of the New York Stock Exchange to me was the most important image that I gathered in 2002 because it was the time of the American collapse of the New York Stock Exchange. The world was going crazy for what was going on. And for me, our money is cattle. So I tried to paint cattle, which was a real difficult thing. As the trade, as the stock, as the exchange. What came out of it is these livestock paintings that were then chosen to go to Cuba, to Havana, to the Biennale. The thing about it was that I schlepped a 17 meter Corda sculpture that I designed with Paul Chains in Pardon Island. It had to be dismantled into a little bag with the artwork. I schlepped it all on the plane, on the plane to Havana, to Cuba, and hung it in a prison three stories high, I took a drill this size in order for it to walk like this so that the people walked through and could feel the banknotes. Because the banknotes that I bought at the Milneton Market were all worn and used. That's the reason why I did it on cloth. It's about me schlepping the work to Cuba, rolling it up, taking my burden, my luggage, showing it to other people. And the 150 countries that were represented there was for me a representation of bringing in all the people that I see from my viewpoint and having it in a public space. It's the, it leads South Africa, Africa and the broader world in such a way through money. And the images that I've painted on each banknote are representative of 
the pain that I have felt about each country, the oil in Angola, the lack of fish in the sea in Mozambique, the Joburg man striding through the South African one rand note. got a feeling of being washed up from the sea, the fragmentation of people, places, society. So these pieces of floor I found washed up at the sea over many, many years and they still come up. When I saw the vinyl, Aline told me that uh, where she got it from and that brought back memories because that was actually the type of vinyl that we used to do in our house every once a year because in uh, all the Muslim people stay in District 6 like when we have our Eid and then the whole house gets painted, the floors get lifted and the vinyl, new vinyl goes on so the house must be speak and span for Eid day you know so that was exactly when I saw it I asked her and she told me how she ate and collected that you know so it's brought back memories of District 6 you know and today so I went to get my commodities and there I find the Cape Argus today when I'm going to start this work tomorrow and it says district 6 phase 3 reduced delay and please God it seems that the houses will be built 108 residential apartments in the next phase of the redevelopment of district 6 it's a third of what was promised in 2014 but hopefully they'll do it and my work will have significance. From the minute the computer was invented by dear Steve Jobs and all the technological advancement and the pain in all of the world, this idea of this drone circling, watching us all, being involved in every movement that we're involved in, movement, revolution movement and movement, it brought me back at the end of this whole show to myself within the context of this world. And I took my very first selfie, laughing as I did it, because it's such a ridiculous thing to take a selfie with your arm and have brought and collected all these fragments which really I have wanted to make something of them, these treasures that I have found over years, and seen from above, for me, they, they hold the notion of myself, my mind, my being fragmented as it is and slowly pulling myself together so that I can once again begin another journey which I don't know in what direction I'm going to go.